Okay, so very good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, today's, for today's lecture, we will be learning about, more specifically about journals, okay? So last week's course, you've learned about the different kinds of um, sources that you can get, resources. So literature and then how you're going to source it via like um, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, your own school library, um, which may, uh, or your university library, which may not necessarily be very equipped. Um, so this is why some of the online ones will be quite very, will be quite good. And then also that um, specimens itself uh, are an important form of reference. So especially particularly type material when you're describing new species or if you need to refer to them. So now, more specifically, we're focusing on journal articles related to taxonomy. Why I want to explain this further is because the way the scientific writing for taxonomy and publishing it is a little bit different from your conventional way of writing um, writing a scientific paper. The, the, the gist of it is quite there, but we will actually run through how the the, the writing style is different. So our objectives for today is, okay, how to read and write species description. So you'll be do, looking at different kinds of taxonomic uh, publications, journal publications, uh, but typically all of them will have uh, a heading and what is synonymies, uh, sorry, synonyms. And then you have etymology or how a species, a new species is named. What is the type material and the voucher specimens? Uh, how do you write material examine? Diagnosis, your description, uh, taxonomic discussion, what do you write other than your diagnosis or description? And ecological section, and as well as occurrence and distribution. So, all right, coming to types of taxonomic literature. So again, this is a recap for last week's work. It, um, all right, so again, the different kinds of literature that we discussed last week, okay, is this one that is general guides, like uh, a quick guide to, a quick guide to, um, say, birds of Southeast Asia. Sometimes it can be pictorial, sometimes not. It really depends on how detailed it is. Okay, this is a very general guidebook. Field guides, in comparison to field guides, sorry, I'm jumping here. Uh, they are a little bit more helpful in explaining to you how to go to the field and sample these works. So general guides might actually help you with the biological aspect of the species you're looking at. See, the biology again of birds, okay? This is a guide. But the field guide is, it'll be more catered to how you're going to sample. It may actually have keys. Most of them are quite helpful. And it's, again, catered to the region that you're working at. So books and textbooks, it's always a very good start for those who have no idea on the biology of the specimens you're working on. Say you're very much interested in working on selps uh, or tunicates, but you have no idea of what the biology of those the, the species is, or not even the species, just generally what is it about. So it's very good to start with uh, general textbooks. Uh, some of them actually do have um, generalization of the higher taxa, meaning to say that a lot of these books will actually cover phyla, of this is the plural for phylum, and also maybe classes. Family sometimes, but it really depends because, again, this is a general textbook which is supposed to give you an explanation about what the whole, uh, the biology of and the other uh, mechanisms work in terms of the reproduction or its feeding behavior, etc. When you're looking at abstracts or indices, it's basically like, it's equivalent to even a checklist. So it's, it just gives you a list of what is available um, Again, either worldwide, it can be specifically for your region. It's just a, a, a list of what is available. And sometimes these abstracts and indices are very helpful because they also will give you uh, where the type of the species you're interested in is located. 
And the ones that you really want to do thorough literature search is your taxonomic journals because these ones actually addresses um, issues regarding uh, species level or even family level. And then sometimes when you want to describe new species, etc., this is where taxonomic literature is, uh, is very important. So one of the journals that you're looking at is Zoo Taxa, but there's actually a lot more available journals out there, like Zoo Keys, uh, Biotexa, etc. And, okay, so if you're looking at taxonomic journals, so you have different kinds of taxonomic journals, okay? So you, these are some of the kinds that you have. So you'll have one that is a species description. So a dis description, so usually a species description is a description of a single new species. Uh, and it can be published by itself. So the things that you describe of this single species is usually about, uh, you may talk about the physiology, the morphology, reproduction, and ecology. ecology. So this one's usually, um, they may come under the taxonomic discussion, as I've mentioned. If you're talking about description and diagnosis, it's um, very catered to the species itself. It's a different context other than the discussion. And then you have redescription. So redescription, if you remember me showing you a paper from the Biodiversity Heritage Library online last week, you would have noticed that um, some of those papers, although it was good at that time in the 1800s or 1700s, but if you want to actually look at the specimens now, um, in terms of the current taxonomic, the modern taxonomic language, it's probably not as detailed. So this is where sometimes you need to re-describe some of this material. So it involves examining of the existing material. Because remember, you cannot afford to describe new species and disregard all specimens that were already described by authors back then. So that is why it involves, you have to re-examine and you have to re-describe that specimen that a previous author has done according to modern taxonomic times, okay? So existing material and information in order to make a more complete description of a species or other group. So again, when you mean my more complete description, it's according to modern uh, taxonomic, uh, written taxonomic times in comparison to what was before. It is often carried out when a new species has been found and its generic placement must be evaluated. Okay, so what they mean by this is sometimes, um, perhaps I can give you a redescription. Okay, so this is a paper that I did, which is a redescription of uh, two known species. Okay, uh, example, Ceratotoa carinata and Ceratotoa oxyrancana. So these are actually recorded for the first time in Australia. However, this species have actually been found previously in other places. But the description was actually very poor. So we needed to re-describe this. And then coincidentally, when looking at these two species, when we're looking at other species, I also noticed that another species, Ceratotoa curvicoda, uh, which was described by Nonomura, is actually the same species as Ceratotoa carinata. So this is where I'm getting at. So what this author thought to be a new species, when I looked at this, the species morphology again and its description, it fits exactly to Carinata. However, again, we have to synonymize uh, this to Ceratotoa Carinata because this author was the first one to write it in 1869. His description may have been poor, but the specimen is still available. The type material is still available. So we cannot particularly discredit uh, Bianconi's work. We have to, uh, neither are we uh, um, discriminating Nonomura's work because yeah, he found it in Japan. So perhaps he didn't really look into Karinata's, uh, into Bianconi's work thoroughly. But we have to synonym, uh, synonym, say, Naimais this. Alright. 
So, uh, so when I am actually describing the species, I will actually put a list of all authors that have worked on this. But the original species of Karinata was actually found. Uh, so I've mentioned in a part here for your for description, Bianconi actually found it in Mozambique. So Nanomora actually found it in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. All right. So that is that is why it sometimes it becomes a little bit um, difficult if you don't look at all the papers thoroughly. So this is how a redescription of the species is. So I actually worked on this material because this is one that was not found in uh, Australia. But then I, I managed to actually recognize the species. It had a very distinct feature. So it was actually very easy to recognize it. So that's why I could pull together all other authors who have worked on this. So this is how a redescription looks like. And then going back to a work of this one, description of higher taxa. So description of higher taxa is where you describe a new taxa at a family level. So this one can be, a, when you're talking about a description, it can be at a species level. It can also sometimes be on a genus level. But then you have descriptions that are also at a family level. Um, okay. And then if you're working on invertebrates, you can find yourself working on something completely baffling. When you mean by baffling, it can be very complex. It can be very different. It you know, one can assume that it looks similar to the species you work with, but it's actually not. So it's, um, it can be very tricky. Usually working on new species is always very easy and straightforward. When you're tackling higher taxa by family level or even class sometimes, it actually becomes a little bit more difficult. Okay, then you have taxonomic genus such as synopsis, which is a general view to summarize current knowledge of morphology, ecology, and terminology. Okay, um, so if you notice that it's covering ecology and terminologies and classification, it's um, a little bit more broader compared to the typical taxonomic paper that has descriptions and diagnosis. Okay, so it's compiled largely for the purpose of species identification. They give descriptions and illustrations of species known. So, again, it's quite, if you want to um, sort of make a comparison, because it has illustrations and species identification, it's a little bit like a field guide. But again, a field guide is more for those who are still novices or those beginners who are still, uh, who need to know how to sample the species, etc. Synopsis, it's like a full list with the pictures and it actually uh, will have um, your synonym list. Uh, when I'm talking about synonym list, I will actually come to that topic soon. Okay, They may contain practical information and collection and preservation as well as keys to the species. So this also is going to be very helpful because if it has keys, then um, it's easier for you to identify the species, especially if you're working on your region. Now, a review paper... So I think a lot of the third years are doing review papers, um, not just for, for taxonomy, uh, some on a broader aspect as well. So I know a lot of you pening kapala, but please um, bear in mind that review papers are also very equally important. So reviews is a publication in which an author critically examined previous work and material on a group. So yes, you are looking at literature, uh, you're doing like a literature review. However, a literature review, you're sort of discussing openly about um, the kind of aspects people have worked on, okay? But if you want to do a review paper that includes results and discussion, you have to have some form of comparison with your own um results and you have to read the results and discussion of other papers and make a compilation of that and and sort of because sometimes some works are very sporadic when i use the term sporadic meaning to say say author a has worked on um say okay let's give an idea of doing a review paper for southeast asia 
Okay, so maybe for some, uh, there are authors who worked uh, for for Myanmar. Some have worked on Vietnam. Some have worked on Singapore, but no one has actually made the effort to compile this to make it for a review for Southeast Asia. So then you as the author doing this, it is, it is it's not just compiling this work, okay? And not just compiling their results. You actually have to really critically review, make statistics based on those results as well. If you have your own um, results to add on, say, if you're working on the Malaysian region and nobody has worked on it, and you add on to this review, is also very important. So if, if you don't by chance have any results, but you're doing Typically on reviews for uh, Southeast Asia on other papers, again, as much as you're compiling people's work, you have to critically discuss their results because they were discussing based on what they found. You have to discuss on everybody's aspect. So if you're working on 50 different, uh, 50 different papers, you have to look into 50 different papers. So that is where you do not underestimate that a lot of you who are doing review papers right now, especially the third years, you I can imagine that you feel very lost because you're not very familiar with this work. But again, it's a bit different from literature review because you actually have to examine and analyze and discuss other people's results, not just a review of the literature review like you would do. Okay. So it brings together, there you go, it brings together current information on the group but does not include the detailed examination of relationships that involve in a revision or monograph. So this is just a review. However, for revisions or monograph, is even more detailed. Okay, and it's actually bigger. Sometimes monographs, I have done a monograph before. It can go up to even 100 over pages. It's very intense. It's like monographs are, is a book by itself, technically. That's how detailed it is. Okay, review is a second next to being more gempa, all right? So it is often carried out in conjunction with description and new species. So sometimes, again, like, remember like how I showed you for the redescription? I wanted to do a redescription for just these two species, but when I was also analyzing uh, uh, the list of other species, so because initially this curvicoda was actually written as a separate species, but when I look at this back, I was like, hey, actually this is the same species. So, usually, what your objectives were, example, my objective was to re-describe this, sometimes you will stumble upon other things along your way. So, this tends to happen a lot when you're doing uh, a review for a species level or a genus level or even family or even higher. Now, coming to catalog. Again, catalogs, uh, catalog, uh, uh, catalogs or spelt as catalog, is a complete list of items arranged in an organized way. Again, it's a, it's a list of how things are written. A taxonomic catalog usually describes the species or uh, the specimen or species of a group of organisms that are found in the collection of a particular museum or herbarium. So technically, um, some of my master's students and some of the FYP students who are attached in RRC, they are looking at the, all the lists available within the museum. So this is where the catalog or checklist is coming through. It's a list of all of the species that's available. So it may just list the species present uh, or it may include annotations on the taxonomy of the species or the conditions of the specimen. So sometimes you may even write whether the specimens are broken, is in good shape, or even you will actually have pictures. And you may even include descriptions for each species covered. Sometimes not necessary, checklists or catalogs just will have a uh, version. Say that again. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you might just have just the list of all the species, okay? So it may also be used as a taxonomic publication discussing all of the species reported from a region or a cruise or expedition. Okay, so some of my students who are working on this, then you would understand what I'm talking about. So this is what I mean by checklist or catalog, and it's equally important because you will actually do a list um, say in this case it's for the Malaysian region and some of the species were from these expeditions okay and then you have uh, you have another kinds uh, three more kinds here so you have a revision 
So a revision involves a restudy of a group to correct or improve its diagnosis, description, and phylogeny. So this one is a bit more complex because uh, some will actually include molecular phylogeny, but some it's a revision of diagnosis and description. So I actually have done a revision here. Sorry, I haven't done a revision. Um, so it's actually a review. Sorry, sorry, I should, shouldn't share that. So a taxonomic revision may include many papers in which new arrangement shifts and rank of the position of some of these included taxa proposed. In a generic and family revision, complete descriptions are usually given for every species, whether or not they have been described before. So this is the, the, the mother of all papers, the monographs. Monographs treat the systematic group in a most complete and detailed possible way. It covers biology and ecology as well. Uh, so a monograph on a genus with introductory chapters plus a detailed description of all species included. Often but not always, they are worldwide in geographic coverage. Um, so I have example here, a monograph which I have written. Where is that monograph? Okay, so this monograph actually was just, can you imagine, it's just, uh, although it's written here as a review, but... Um, you're technically reviewing the semithoa, but it's so big that it actually had to the the editors actually had to put it as a monograph. Okay, so what the monographs will cover is okay. You have the normal abstract. You have an introduction. Your materials, methods, your taxonomy, and then uh, I've also I've made a key to the to this genus for the Australian for the Australian semithoa. So it's just Australia. So if I were to do globally, it will be even more complex. Okay, but I've also done another key for just the buckle attaching genera. So um, yeah, so basically this is how my key would look like. Uh, and it's also inclusive of all of the other papers that I've did. So it's more like a series thing. Okay, so I've covered all the different sets of um, buckle attaching parasitic um, isopods. So it's like Spinisma, Olensera, uh, Ceratotoa, etc. Then when it's coming to Simothoa, I did another key just for the species of Simothoa in Australia. So yeah, this is pretty much how it works, right? So then later on, after the key, I will explain about each species in terms of um, their description and their diagnosis if it's necessary for some. Okay, and then this last one is surveys, field guides, and checklists. Um, so the surveys, field guides, and checklists can be a little bit different from a typical field guide. So again, it's only when you are more exposed to all these different kinds, you will understand better what I'm talking about. So if it's a survey, it stresses on the characteristics of local populations and by limiting discussions and distribution to a particular geographic region. Field guides and identification handbooks are similar to flora and fauna surveys but they cover limited geographic area um, because they are designed for field or amateur use. Okay, And checklists may merely list the species found and may contain discussion and synonyms. Okay, so why I wanted to this to, to run through you uh, run through this with you is because a lot of you have already submitted your papers. So I want you, while I'm doing the discussion, I also want you um I will actually give a list of uh, what um, some of the questions that you have to answer based on the paper that you have found. And I want you to sort of understand where does your paper fit in these types of journals? Is it a species description? Is it a redescription? Or any of these others? Okay, so this is one. Now we're coming to the breakdown of some of this um, uh, what do you call this, some of this parts of the paper. Before I move into this, do any of you have any questions? Any questions related to the paper that you found and how it fits in this? Okay, so if there are no questions, I assume everybody is fine with this. All right. Okay, so then I will move on to the headings. 
So now coming to the headings, I've explained to you, I explained this to you in your first class itself, where you have the species name, and then you have the author and the year. So just take note, um, there are different styles of writing it, and the ones in blues are the ones that are written for um, zoological purposes. The ones in greens are written for uh, for botany, okay, for for plants. All right, so if you see this example, of course, the typical one is the capital for your for the genus, and then it's followed by um, all small alphabets for this the genus and the species. Only the first one is capital, and then it's written as the author with a comma and then the year. Now, sometimes the the species can be written like this, but the author is just written like this with the year. Typically, this is not practiced often, but this can be written for those that are very much established. So if it's L, does anybody by chance know who, who this L represent? Based on the forefathers of taxonomy. Anyone? Okay, no idea, never mind. So, if you are familiar with Carl Linnaeus, okay, the father of taxonomy. So, if you've come to a, that form of authority to write, um, what do you call this, uh, to be a very prominent author, so you can write it as Linnaeus as such. So, um, another, okay, for, for plants, for those authors who are very um, prominent as well, they would actually write it as such. This one has a bracket. <coughs> um this one is written openly as such. Um, and then if you have two authors, again, if your name is not fully complete, uh, it's because these authors are actually very prominent in their field of expertise. And then, of course, uh, we sometimes write with the word and, as in spelling it out A-N-D, but you can also write the symbol. Uh, the symbol is called an ampersand. Okay? Uh, that is, if, you're, if you have two authors... Yeah, and usually, again, it goes to three authors. We One doesn't encourage many authors, but this is a style of writing. And of course, if you have the bracket, it's because the name has changed over time. So when Veril 1990 first described this, the name was proposed as Leodice Elegance. But other authors actually have found that probably it is best to put it in a different genus. So sadly, the... Um, these the other authors are not particularly uh, not say not recognized. It's just that it's not written here. But if you want to check out their work, yes, you can always check out their work. But again, credit is always be given to the first authors. Okay, <clears throat> for plants, however, um, if you notice in this case, um, they actually have two names. So for plants, uh, okay, like Sargassum muticum, okay, they write yendo and they also write fanshot. So now initially, the name was recognized as Sargassum cal, uh, gelmanium forma muticus. So this is how yendo in 1907 wrote this. However, fanshot later wrote it... Um, as such, Sargassum muticum. So, again, credit is given to the first author here. However, uh, at later stages, when Fenchard realized that this species should be recognized as such, so credit is given to Yendo here, that's why he's still in bracket, but the later author was actually recognized here. Okay, and then um, another example is Vibrunum ternatum, uh, where is rather in sergeant. So when you mean by rather in sergeant, uh, it's just that the, the reader was actually who wrote this is found in the works of sergeant later. Okay, uh, and this is also a similar way of writing this. Um, where X is supposed to recognize that this work by such author is actually found in boys. Alright, so again, this is the style for botany, 
But for zoology, how we always recognize it as is just the first author. If it's the name that's still applied till now, we don't have the bracket. If it's a bracket, meaning the name has changed over time. At this stage, are there any questions with heading? Okay, no questions. I will move on to synonyms. Now, for synonyms, the different names that have been used for taxon. Okay, uh, I believe I have the list here. Uh, I'm coming to that stage later. So, just bear with me here. So, synonyms like how you would understand it in thesaurus, it has a list of different names um, that is understood for one, uh, for one particular uh, word. Okay, for example, the word big. What are the other synonyms for big? You have majestic, you have gigantic, you have enormous. So, that's what you mean by that. So, when you mean by a subjective synonym, it's two or more different names of the taxa that a specialist considers belong to the same taxon. Okay, other terms that are similar to subjective synonyms are heterotrophic synonyms or taxonic synonyms. A junior synonym is the later publish of two or more names based on identical specimens considered to be horn-specific. It's the later published names, all right? So for a subjective synonym, this example is Huyendo, who described many sargassum species, two of which included um, these two species, okay? So now later workers had trouble distinguishing these two species. So however, Yoshida, a later order in 1978, he looked carefully at these reproductive patterns and concluded that they were conspecific. Con specific means it's the same species. And he gave a new name, which is Sargassum Miyabe, which actually interestingly was uh, Miyabe was described before Gelmanium. Okay. So that's why um, Sargassum Miyabe was described earlier. That one is given priority. Remember, always look at the year the person first described it. So, if it's a later author, like probably this one came in a little later, we have to give credit to Mayabi. Okay? So, Sargassum Mayabi is given priority and Sargassum Gelmanium was considered the junior synonym. Okay? So, easy to remember, a senior synonym will always be the first year. The other years, the later works are considered junior synonym. Any questions here before I move on to the next example? Okay, very good. No, no questions. Yeah, let me just check the chat very quickly. No questions. Okay, thank you.